And as we look at this, there's a, uh, there's a few points we want to hit right here before we jump into the rest of it. Uh, but, but going into uh, the, the first few verses here, what, uh, uh, what we're trying to say is that uh, all the people that, uh, as we go back to this morning, we use the phrase that we walk not as other Gentiles walk. Uh, all we're trying to do and all, all the author here is trying to paint you the picture of is at one point in your life, you was that person. At one point in our life, we was, uh, we was uh, those that uh, may have been, uh, as you go through here and you look, uh, foolish, disobedient, uh, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. At some point in our life, we was all those things. Uh, as, uh, we, this may be the point we're at in our life when we are these things now, but we need to understand that as born-again believers, as Christian people, uh, the, the renewing of our mind says, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. It means all that this is saying is that we should have put on the new man. Is it, We should uh, uh, truly have have accomplished the portion where it says behold all things are become new we are uh, the, the old man has passed away all these things all these things are are, are relevant they're prominent there are things that we should know there are things that uh, it, it's not a myth it's not something that uh, people just preach for a while and and and, and done this or that but uh, when it says that the old that behold all things uh, are become new we should be that new creature we should have a new uh, approach to life we should have a new approach to uh, to, to, to life our situations to all the things that happen we should begin to be a bit new but it's saying that all these things happen it says not my works of righteousness you can't just decide that well I'm going to read my Bible you can't just decide I'm going to go to church more you can't just decide that well you know well maybe I'm going to do this maybe I'm going to do this our works of righteousness if you will is not what's going to cut it church it's not a uh let me think of the best way to, to phrase it without confusing you. As much as we are talking about and saying that it is a mindset, it's not a mindset. It is a lifestyle. It is a life change. It is something that uh, uh, truly, uh, it's not something that you just occasionally think on. It's not something that whenever you finally, uh, uh, you, you, you will try your best to, to, to like others and to love others and to help and to do more and to help more. It's not a thing that you do this until you just kind of get tired and worn out and you decide that you'll go back to doing the old things. That's not what it is. It is a true change in your life style, in your life period in order to truly be a child of God that approved workman of God it is it is not something that you just think on occasionally it is something that is a process that you go through you, you have to look at the entire body of work if you will the, the, through the entirety of what it is that we do it's not attending church it's not just reading our Bible it is how we act in public it is who we are in public you know uh, if you read all your little Sunday school lesson this morning uh, you know uh, people will see the Christian people in the world world a lot of times what they see is the uh, uh, as the book wrote it the, the Christians who are whining the Christians who are worrying uh, the Christians who are uh, 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 um, uh, well for lack of better words the, the, the hypocrites of the, of the bunch that's what people see they don't see the people who are living an inspired life those people who are truly living uh, based, uh, uh, and walking solely upon faith and, and trust in God those are the people that the rest of the world don't see because I told you this morning, the world is not the problem. The world is the same day as it was in the days of Noah. It's the same as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. The world is the same as it was in the day of Jesus. The world has not changed. We have. The church has changed. The individuals have changed. We have become uh, tolerant. We have become uh, accepted. We have become, uh, we have uh, invited the world into our hearts and into our lives and into our churches, into our marriages, into our homes, into our, uh, uh, whatever it is that you want to uh, uh, say there, but we have invited it all in and we have become uh, um, tolerant of these things. But in verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. We didn't have to do anything other than accept that gift. But there's a word in here that I need you to know. Regeneration. It's kind of a neat little word. 
You know what's kind of neat about your liver? If half of it goes away, it can grow back. You know, a starfish truly is unique. Because a starfish can lose one of its limbs, one of its arms, and it can grow back. You ever walked around the ocean or around a pier or whatnot and found starfish? You ever done this? You ever notice that sometimes you'll find one that has five arms and sometimes you'll find some that has four? Do you know why? Because sometimes they have lost one and it has not grown back yet. Why is this important, preacher, and why in the world are you talking about this? Because it is something new that comes back and takes its place. Anybody ever seen a blue-tailed lizard? Anybody ever seen a no-tailed lizard? And then if that lizard stays around long enough, you know what it'll be before long? It'll be another blue-tailed lizard. It's a new tail that grows in its place. It is not the old one that comes shining through. It is something that is new. It is something that is afresh. It is something that is entirely different. It goes all the way back to exactly what Jesus said to be born again. It means you are not the same person. It means that man truly did die and you was born again, but you was born into the Spirit. It says, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, it is a renewing of the inward man. All this is fed if you go back to Colossians uh, and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. All these things are relevant. They are relevant because as we turn to Hebrews, we're going to look at this. We as Christian people, I told you, have become a, a, a tolerant and accepting of the things that it should be not tolerated and unacceptable. Does that make sense? I'm not sitting here telling you to hate. Don't, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. What I am saying is that we should not be accepting the behaviors and the actions and the lifestyles. I'm not saying you need to reject the people. Understand what is being said. It is purely scriptural. You love the sinner, not the sin. But we condone these behaviors. And how, why do I say that we condone these behaviors? Because we have these behaviors that come inside the church house. It's these behaviors that have, uh, that have truly, uh, uh, between greed and selfish desires and people's own pride, these are the things that tear churches apart. If you don't believe me, I can tell you a church to go visit. And it's because of greed and selfish desires and pride. Those things, you invite them in the church house, that is not a part of the regenerative life that, that, that God desires you to have, that, that new growth that should be within, uh, from within you. But in the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews, it says this, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Understand that what we are speaking of here. We are speaking to the born again believers. We are not talking to the lost. We are talking to the church-going people and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now understand that we are talking to those people. We are talking to you and I. Verse 6, if they shall fall away. Do not misconstrue what the Bible is saying. It does not say a loss of salvation. All this is speaking of is the age of apostasy. It is speaking of the, 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 the lack of fellowship. It is the, the, the church age, the, the latter days, the, the, the church in which we, uh, uh, the time in which we live, in the time of apostasy, the great falling away, all these things that Jesus says has to happen before he can return. It is these folks in which we are talking to, if they shall fall away, to renew them. Renew them. It is not saying that, uh, 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 well, let's read on, it says to renew them again unto repentance. Again unto repentance. They don't say they have to be saved again. How is this possible? What are we talking about? Walk not as other Gentiles walk because it can start very simple. Anybody in here have been saved? Okay. 
Let's take a stroll with me, shall we? You hadn't been saved very long, and you wasn't very well, uh, 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 um, you wasn't well, um, trained or well versed in the Bible. You wasn't, uh, uh, you, you, you was unsure of a lot of things, but there was a, uh, there was a really nice fellow that you went to church with that took the liberty to truly, uh, uh really want to help you out. You know what I'm saying? He really wanted to, he was going to take you underneath his wing and, uh, you know, uh, uh he, he might have had a few radical ideas and things might have been a little bit strange, but he really wanted to help you and he began to teach you. Uh, but what you didn't know is he was teaching you something that was wrong. He was leading you in the wrong direction, but she was really, uh, uh, kind of devout at that time and he was really following him but the, the more you read the more you studied and you begin to find out that these things were wrong does that mean that you was lost the entire time all it means is you was saved and you was led astray but all those things that you could have been taught in those few weeks in those few months in those few years there is a thing that needs to happen and it's a thing called repentance, the very first thing that happened the first time you got saved. The time you got saved. You repented, you had to turn away from what you was. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. You understand daily. I believe it's in the, uh, the, the Gospel of Luke that it says that uh, uh, we must bear our cross daily. The other Gospels will say that we must bear our cross, but it does not say daily. I'm pretty sure Luke is one that adds the word daily. Right here in Hebrews, afresh, renewed, the renewing that is there. Let me tell you guys something amazing. You can't change 15 minutes ago. You can't go back to yesterday. You can do nothing about two seconds ago. There's nothing you can do about it. It is gone. It is history. It is something that you cannot get back. The only thing that you, church-going people, can affect is now... And after. You understand what I'm saying? There is absolutely not one thing you can do about earlier this week. Don't worry about it. Don't stress on it. Because it was in the past and it means nothing to you. Let me tell you a story. Actually, let me just give you a hypothetical question here. Let's say that you have $100,000. Let's say MD has $100,000. And I say, MD, can I see one of your dollars? You got a dollar? Let me see if I got a dollar. I have a dollar. MD, let me see one of his dollars. And while I was holding it, I wadded it up. And as I wadded it up, it got tore just a little bit. And to you, that rent your dollar. There is, you, you can't use that. It is worthless. Just throw it away. Would it make any sense for you to spend every dime of the rest of your money trying to fix that one dollar? Does that make any sense to you? How much money did I say you had? $100,000. So how much money would he spend trying to do something about this one dollar? How much money would he spend? Somebody do the math. Does that make any sense to you whatsoever? Would you call that, would you say that that is something that is ignorant and stupid? Yes, we would. So if somebody ruins one second of your day, why do you spend the rest of your day worrying about it? If somebody ruins your Monday, why do you spend until Sunday trying to get Monday back? It's gone. You cannot affect it. You cannot change it. So why waste our time worrying on it? Tomorrow, church, is a new day. It is a new week. The preacher might make you mad this Sunday, but that don't mean he's going to next Sunday. It is a new day. 
You may have had a horrible week. You may have had your feelings hurt. People may have walked all over your pride. You may have been belitt belittled. You, uh, there could have been things that uh, people may have sent slurs your way. Maybe they could have uh, uh, made very smart aleck remarks into you and really hurt your feeling. But guess what? Get over it. There is nothing that you can do about it. To renew them again into repentance. God did not call you to live in the past. God called you to live in the eternal. You understand what I'm saying? All these things are, are, are pointless unto you and I. So now then let's think of this. We're not going to spend our fortunes trying to fix one dollar. We're not going to spend our life trying to fix one moment that wasn't perfect. But all this has to do with our, the approach of our mind. And has anybody uh, really been uh, uh, accustomed to the, uh, to the book of Ephesians where it talks about putting on the whole armor of God? Anybody ever read that? Anybody? Turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. I'm well aware that this is not where the armor of God is, but stay with me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says this, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Now let's turn over here to where the uh, 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 armor of God is. It says, Wherefore taking you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand uh, in the day of evil and having done all to stand, uh, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. You understand that we're reading this the exact same way, but we're not talking about our body at this point, but we're talking about our mind. We are talking about our inner spiritual self. It says, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, our mind, our thought process. Be sober. When I say be sober, everybody in here, the first thing you're going to think of is a beer can. You're going to think of a needle. You're going to think of some kind of pill. You're going to think of some kind of drug. That is not the only intoxicants that there is. Those are not the only things that alters your state of being. Rage will alter your state of being. It will control your mind. It will make you do things that you typically would not do. In a bit of rage, I have said things to my wife that I did not mean, that I would not typically say. In a fit of rage, I have said things to my mama I would not typically say nor do. You cannot tell me that rage is not an intoxicant. It, become, it, it then begins to control your emotions. It begins to control your attitude and your actions just the same as if I had been uh, uh, strung out on cocaine or meth or alcohol or whatever it is you want it to be. Anger and rage can do the exact same thing. Hatred can make you act in a way that you typically would not act. All these things are intoxicants to your mind. So when the Bible says, wherefore gird, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. That means that not only do you dress the outward man with the whole armor of God, but most importantly, you put it on the inward man because this body, church, will pass away. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Your former self. What does it say here? As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves, not likening yourselves, not becoming again what you used to be. A renewing, a regeneration, a rebirth. A, uh, uh, all these things are becoming new and afresh each time God gives you the opportunity to wake up. We may be uh, uh, doing good at this point. We may be living close to God, right? We may be uh, 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 really uh, um, Christian-like. But just as I said, yesterday means nothing, church. Just because you was good yesterday does not mean that you're going to be good tomorrow. 
Just because you went to church on Sunday and because you went to church again on Sunday night does not mean that come Monday morning you're still a Christian. Coming here means nothing more than you came here. It is what we do in the here. It is what we do here. It is what we're going to do tomorrow. It is what we're going to do in the after. It is the true renewing of our mind. But as he which hath called you is holy. Would anybody disagree with that fact? That the one who has called us is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Conversation does not mean just the way you speak. It means in the entirety, the whole body of work of who you are. From the way you dress, to the what you eat, to what you drink, to what you put in your home, to what you put on your TV. In its entirety means be ye holy, for I am holy. All of it together. If you, talk, if, you, if you take time out here for just a moment and you think on what makes us who we are. If you think, just pick, pick somebody. Pick somebody in your life. What makes them who they are? What makes me who I am? We can go back and we can say that, well, you know, part of what makes me who I am is how I was raised and how I was brought up and, and, and all these different things. But that, that's not it. It is what, what makes us who we are. It's truly our conversation, our personality. What makes me be a cut up? What makes me be a, a somewhat laid back? What makes me be these things? What, what, what is it that when you think, uh, uh, when someone says your preacher, when somebody asks you who your preacher is, what pops into your mind? These things is what makes you who you are. So who exactly are you? What makes you you? You ever seen somebody outside of church? You ever took, so just for a minute, you didn't recognize them? If you see me Monday through Friday and it's hot weather, typically I'll be wearing shorts, tennis shoes, or flip flops, spend them on if I'm working. And most of the time I do not wear sleeves. That's a far cry from dress pants and nice colored shirts. You see me Monday through Friday, I don't look anything like this because typically I only shave on Friday or Saturday. Who you guys get to see on Sunday is not who the world gets to see through the week. Who I get to see on Sunday is not who the world gets to see the rest of the week. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. Do not dwell upon the things of the world because the Bible teaches in Jesus' words you cannot serve two masters. But why is it important that it says, gird up the loins of your mind? I am going to tell you. I'm going to tell you from the book of Matthew. And in Matthew and in 22 verse 37, it's going to say this, and we're going to echo this later on in Deuteronomy probably. But it says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind all these things we can love God with our uh, 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 with our body fairly easily it's, the, it's not really that hard to uh, to, to, to maybe uh, uh, um, do the things physically that the Bible wants us to do that's not really that hard it's not really that hard for the, the, the inner man to truly love Christ because in all honesty, the spirit of the man is the only part that really is going to know how to love the Lord because that's going to be the part that, uh, uh, that's going to be a sermon as a message for a different time, but that would be the easy part. But the hardest part for us to love the Lord with would be our mind 
And as we are sitting here, we think that that would be the easiest part because it's just what we think. Well, it's easy for us to think, yeah, I love the Lord. But to a lot of us, that's exactly what it is. We think that. We think that we are living the life. We think these things, but are you truly having the mind to do so? If you read on down, it says this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Meaning that if you can't love the Lord with all your mind, body, and soul, and mind, and spirit, and all these different things, you can do nothing more. If you can't do that, there is no way you can love your brother. There is no way that you cannot covet, that you cannot uh, uh, commit adultery, that you cannot steal, that you can't lie. If you can't just love the Lord with all your mind, you can't do the rest. How are ways that we love the Lord with our mind too? I told you it is the entire body of work of what we do, our thought process, the way we approach. But if you turn into the 51st Psalm, it says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. All these things come again, the renewing. No matter what you are today, no matter what you was yesterday, tomorrow is a new day. Complacency and contentment is a Christian's worst nightmare. We get content in who we are. We get content in what we're doing. We're content in uh, ourselves, if you will. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You may get tired of getting beat down. You may get tired of the, 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 the pressures of the world, the pressures of life, and all these things. But it's the inward man. It's our mindset. It is what is on the inside of this that the world cannot touch. I might can break your arm, but that's about all I can do to you. I can't take, I can't physically take your joy from you. I can't physically take the peace that God puts in your heart from you. You can let me have it, but I can't take it. Going back into Titus. It says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's not anything, church, that we have done or that we can do. This is something that God just, and understand what it, what it says here, which he shed on us abundantly. It wasn't, God didn't just give you a little. He didn't give you just barely enough to help you to scrape through. What God has given you is sufficient to carry you through whatever it is that you shall face. But having the mindset of a, I want to. I remember uh, uh, it's been uh, several years ago, but we had an entire Wednesday night lesson over, vocab uh, over one's vocabulary and what the different words is, what they mean when it says I want to or uh, I, I will, I'll try, or all these different things. Anybody remember sitting here on that Wednesday night? I remember it very vividly. I could probably go back through and find my notes and give you the whole thing again. But all these things are relevant for this number right here. Wait for it. You ready? How many people desire to have an increase at Oakdale? Whether it be an increase spiritually, an increase uh, uh, numerically, whether it be an increase in uh, uh, whatever it is. People willing to participate and in, in, in to do all the different things. How many people are willing to have an increase? How many people are willing to put forth the work? It's a lot different when you say, well, I wish that uh, 
If you don't believe me, start paying attention. How many people you have on Sunday morning? You divide that by two and you can usually give or take five. That's how many people you have on Sunday night. You don't believe me, you can look on back on the back door board and you can start doing the math. You take the numbers that are here tonight, you divide that by two and you can usually take away ten. And that's how many people be here on Wednesday night. I'm telling you something that it, I, I want you to understand what I'm saying. It's not enough to say, I wish, I wish there's more people that would come. It does you no good to wish that. It does you no good to have a mindset that I wish I was closer to God. It does you no good to have a mind, uh, to, to think to yourself that, well, I, I, I want this. All that matters is what you are willing to do. If you're not willing to walk hand in hand and to walk closely with God, it don't matter what you want. Because when you stand in judgment and you are judged for the good works, uh, the things said and done and thought, both good and bad, all these things are going to happen. Jesus is not going to say, well, I understand this is what you did, but this is what you wanted to do, so it's okay. You're judged for the deeds done, not deeds thought about. Unless it's the bad ones. This I therefore say, testify, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. I need you to understand, church. It don't matter if this church does it. It don't matter if this church does it. It don't matter if these people's doing it. I don't care what the I, I, I don't care what the Southern Baptist Association's doing. I don't care what the Tennessee Baptist Association's doing. I don't care what the Riverside Association's doing. I don't care what the uh, what the United Methodists are doing. I don't care what the Presbyterians are doing. It don't matter what the Pentecostals doing. If it does not align with this book, it does not matter. Church, just because other people's doing it, don't make it right. We are not to walk as other Gentiles. We are not to compare ourselves unto other Gentiles. We are to compare ourselves solely upon this. This is our mirror. This is our benchmark. This is what we are supposed to try and make. It's this. Nothing more. 